Hello and welcome to the Volunteer Development Series podcast. My name is Pat Delizio, the GM of Diamond Valley Basketball, and today we are talking about good committee culture to do this. I'm joined by a man who has played, coached, officiated, and volunteered at Diamond Valley for decades. He was the president of Eltham Notch Jets for five years and the current president of DVBA. Please welcome Stuart Callaghan. Stu, thanks for coming in. Pat, thanks for having me. Did I get all those things right? I wasn't sure. I, nah, I said decades because well, I didn't want to, you know, yeah, give away your age. Five years, the other one was Jeff. It's actually 10, but yeah. Let's, 10. Let's, let's, let's double that, my Yeah, bad. yeah double that, mate. It's just yeah. bad research. Correct. That's all that is. Absolutely. And you make me feel old but or sound old, but that's okay. Yeah, well, that's why I didn't give a specific years. I didn't Thank say you. for X amount of years, but you're welcome to fill us in. How long have you been doing how, stuff down Valley? For? How long? Too long. So, started playing up here when I was uh, probably at seven or eight. Started under eights up here. And started refing when I was fourteen, and have probably been here ever since. Had a little bit of a hiatus when um, my wife had, we had a few children, but um, yeah, had a long, long career up here at Don Valley doing multiple things. So it's been a lot of fun. Absolutely. And you, when you played, who'd you actually play for? Basically? So I played. Um, I've had a few clubs, which is rather interesting. But I played my first season at St Mary's, and then my dad, and this is probably where it all started. He was one of the people who started the St Thomas's basketball club. Right. Okay. So I played the first season at St Mary's because there wasn't a St Thomas's club, and then Dad started the club. So I then started at St Thomas's, played there until I was under sixteen, and then we ran out of players basically, as because I was um, I was only a new club, and I finished my junior career at Apollo. Yeah, right. So uh, yeah, had a few different clubs over the time, just through you know circumstances. But probably watching my dad get involved in uh, volunteering was where it all started for me. So I saw the enjoyment that he had, and a lot of his friends had in setting up a club and giving back, and that's where it all started for me. And watched him do it. What instigated? Do you remember what instigated him to actually do that? Well, it was a new school up the road here at Greensboro, and um, he said, "Well, what are we going to get the kids to do? And um, let's let's try basketball." So there was already footy was already set up and a few other sports. Let's try basketball, and it just started to take off a little bit basketball back then. So that's what prompted him. And he got a few dads together and they said, Let, "Let's make a club." So he was the first president, and um, yeah, I, I have some very very fond memories of um, my time at St Thomas's. I went on coach to coach my little brother, um, yeah, and coach coach some um, pretty famous AFL footballers back in the day who then went on and um, oh, made a on. career out go of uh, kept drop, drop some names. Of, of names. On, Blake Carousella was one. Yeah, nice. nice. So uh, he went on and uh, made a great career out of footy and coaching and all that sort of stuff as well. So um, a, Yeah, parade teacher as well. Parade, really? yeah, yeah, went to parade yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. yep, yep. So, um, yeah, a few others as well. A few of the Echo boys um, played footy as well, Andrew in particular. But, yeah, it was um, a lot of fun and all the, getting, getting to know all the families and the dads and the uh, yearly presentation nights that we had at St Thomas's were uh, a heap of fun. Awesome, that's great. Um, and obviously, you said you you had a little bit of a hiatus there. We stepped away when you had young kids. Yep. Was their involvement what sort of got you back into the stuff? Um, yeah, probably it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When they decided they were going to take up basketball, so they then started playing um, at under eights and. They went to Holy Trinity Primary School, which is where the Elfenwell Jets sort of um, club start, started many years ago. So I then got involved there, got on the committee, and, you know, one thing led to another, and I was soon I was present there. And I th- I'm pretty sure it was about a 10-year stint at um, the Elfenwell Jets, which was great fun, a lot of fun, a lot of um, good friends still today that I see. And, um, yeah, it was um, a great time at the Elfenwell Jets. It was a growing club. They, they got really big during my time there. Um, probably up to 40, 45 teams. So one of the bigger clubs have sort of come back a little bit now. But, yeah, great time. Awesome. Um, so obviously today um, as part of this resource that we're, we're providing for our volunteers through this podcast, um, we thought we'd go down the um, the committee yep. route and talk yep. about that a little bit. Yep. Um, obviously you a lot of people have heard me banging on about how good our board is <laughs> and <laughs> how good the culture yeah, is. Yeah, we have our moments, yeah. Pat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's not with a gun to my head. That's uh, that's genuine, genuine praise. So I thought it'd be great to get you on because obviously this time of year we've got a lot of um, clubs going for their AGMs. Yep. And so they're going to have you know quite a few, maybe some new committee members coming yep. on. Yep. So wanted to ask you straight off the bat regarding committee culture and it might be some things that you've just learnt over the years like yep. um, bit by bit but 
let's say you get a few really good um, people putting their hand up. Mm-hmm. What do you think is the main things that uh, a committee should focus on at club level? Like, what if you pick maybe just a few things off yeah, the bat? Yeah, yeah. What do you well, think that's important? Yeah, look, first you've got to find good people, and you've probably got to target those people as well because people are reluctant these days to put their hand up for volunteering jobs because they worry that they're going to um, take on too much work. Yeah. So the first thing is you've got to target people who you think are good people. Um, look, every, everyone's got a reason for doing volunteering, and in a lot of cases in basketball it's because of their um, daughter or son, so that's fine. But you've got to find good people with good morals. And probably the most important thing, and I'll, and I'll say this a few times today, you've got to give everyone a voice. And if you don't give people a voice, then uh, people won't be involved, they won't feel part of the club, and they'll then they'll slowly disappear. So by that I mean when it comes to voting, when it comes to asking people for input, when it comes to getting people's opinions, everyone, sh- everyone should be involved. There shouldn't be any hierarchy in a committee like that. Sure, you've got a hierarchy that you have to for... Yeah, legal purposes and those sort of things, but everyone should be equal and everyone should have, have a say. And I think that's probably what's made our board at the moment successful because everyone feels like they've got a voice and when it comes to a particular topic or issue, they can they can voice their opinion. And the other thing I'd say is we don't always agree, and I think that's really important. That is, that is, that is That builds a great culture because you can have some very spirited debate, you can listen to people's views, and like I said, give everyone a say. That way, everyone feels really part of it. The other thing I'd say is the being president now for four years at Don Valley and ten at, at the Elf Militets, you've got to learn to delegate. Because if you don't delegate and take it on yourself, no one else will want to help you. And no one else will be involved. But if you can delegate and get people to help you, then everyone feels part of the committee. And that's that's there, there are a couple of really important things. You've got to give people a say. So you're talking about being really specific in terms of um, the roles, or do you mean... Um, when you go into a meeting and you come to some sort of decision, it's really saying, okay, well, you go away and do that, you go away and yep. do that, you go yep. away and do that. B- both of those. And then yeah. when you come to an p- important decision, go to a vote and let everyone have their, have their point of view, have their opinion. Yep. And majority is going to rule. The other thing I'd say is it's always good to have an odd number yep. on your committee because under most constitutions, if there's an even number, the president gets the final vote. And I don't think that's a good thing. I think it should be an odd number so that everyone – now, ultimately, you'll get a result. So um, I don't know. We've had that a few times on our committee where you know we've gone to a split vote, but everyone accepted it because everyone went around the table. Everyone got their opinion. Everyone got their, was able to voice what they wanted, what they thought, and then oh, we go and we make make a vote and make a decision. But everyone feels then part of the committee and feels like they're adding value, and that's the most important thing. And then people will stay. Yeah, you'll get longevity with um, people on your committees. And I've been lucky to have some really good people support me over the time at Don Valley. Rob Bokes been one, and he's just he's just left. And there was a little post on Don Valley's website a little while ago. And Kate Cowan's been there since the start as well. And I went and grabbed Kate and said, she was in Thomas's, and I said, come and work on the ball with me because she was a, a good person, understood basketball, but was in it for the right reasons. She hasn't got any kids involved anymore at Don Valley like I have, but she's still in the committee and still working with us and a really good person and, and happy to take on tasks as, as we needed to. So they're the people you need to find. So what do you think is more important, or maybe it's it's not even about that, but do you think it's more important to have people that have specialised skills in a certain area, or do you think it's just better to just have good people working? No, g- good people would be number one, but it's always nice to have people from different walks of life. Yeah. So I look at our board at the moment, and I've got some, I'll refer to my notes, Pat, just oh, so I don't get good, it, they get, they get it wrong. Um but we've got a really diverse board at the moment. So, um, you know, we've got someone who's a town planner. We've got two lawyers on the board, which is makes very interesting and, and really good rigour. Yeah. Really good rigour and processes when you have lawyers involved. Um, we've got um, someone who runs their own business. We've got a school teacher. We've got someone who works in council land. And we've got someone who works at the NBL. So, really diverse board, but all have got really good strengths and what they bring from their um, prop to their careers, from what they do in, in their career. So, um, yeah, it, it's it's fantastic. So let's talk about problem solving maybe a little bit. And um, I don't know if you if you've had this issue uh, in the past, or maybe at club level, or just some advice that you can give. If you tap someone on the shoulder, yep, because they're a good person and you've gotten to know them through the club and whatnot. And then they start to show signs of like these these little things that, that that might cause red flags or whatever it is. How do you sort of deal with that as the president? Like how do you intervene? Oh, it's not easy, but um, 
yeah, yeah, sometimes you pull them aside and have a quiet word to them, and I've had to do that a few times with um, over the years um, because people do sometimes, you know, stray or normally it's personal interest that gets in the way a little bit, and that's understandable because we're all, we're all normally here. We're all here for our kids. Yep. So, yeah, you sometimes have to have hard conversations with people just around, you know, where they're at and what they're doing and why they're doing and those sort of things. Um, but if you, like I said, if you can surround yourself with good people, you will have one or two. Maybe it's at times that, that co- cause you some problems, but um, ultimately the board as a whole will then still push in the right direction. Yeah. And look, sometimes, you know, those people don't hang around. Sometimes they do. It just depends on, on what they're like. And, you know, but it's always good to have a chat to them and, and be very open and honest with them. No yeah. use, no use not doing that. No, and like I said, I've had to do that a few times and, it, and it's worked. And I guess like when you have a strategic plan in place where you put your values in and yep. all that, there's, there's something to point to. There's like a guiding Absolutely. light to, to sort of drive towards. And we did that a few years ago. And big thanks to Rob because he put that all together for us. Um, John, he, John O as well. John O as well. Yeah. So they've got, they've got strong backgrounds in that from their work, from a work point of view. So it made a lot of sense for them to put the strategic plan together for us, for the board and for the association. And they did that and it's, it's um, now in place. Let's go back a little bit um, because there's different reasons why people get involved to start off with um, and you've gone from club land to association. What instigated your your sort of move to, to, to come onto the DVBA? Um, yeah, look, I was obviously in club land and I was watching from afar what was going on at the board level and, yeah, there was a few things that concerned me and there was a few... Um, probably personality breakdowns that had that had happened, and and I just felt that maybe the direction of the association was had, had just been lost a little bit, and there was they needed to focus more on the domestic side of the competition. There was a, too much of a focus on the other parts of the of the competition, because um, ultimately that's where that's where it all starts. It starts at your domestic competition, at your under eights, under tens, all these boys and girls running around every Saturday, and I just felt we'd lost touch with those people. So coming from domestic land was very easy for me because I understood how important it was. And so then I put my hand up, like I said, to go on the board and grab some really good people with me so that we could make sure we had the right focus on that domestic competition. So that happened and um, then we had, a, I won't lie to you, we had a few challenges and those those that are listening who have been around a while will know some of the challenges that we, we faced with when we um, first took over. But... We're here today and it's, it's been an outstanding success. But a few things we had to do was put in place good governance. Like I said, get a good board together, but probably also get some good staff. Yeah, and, and that's where you came in when we hired you. How long ago now? Four or five years ago now? <laughs> Two years. Two years. Is that all it's been? <laughs> yes. It feels like a lot longer, Pat, let me tell you. Um, there you go. But we, we then hired good staff and put good people so that the day-to-day runnings of the association are not done by the board. If the board get involved in the day to the day to day runnings, then you then you've got issues. You've got to let the paid staff do that, run that, and the board then can make those higher executive decisions that that um, help the the association long term. But we had to put that foundation in place, and that took a bit of time. But we eventually got the right people, and here we are today. So, do you think it's important? Obviously, going back to club level, where there's no staff in place, and obviously the, yep, the committee yep. is doing all the work. Yep. You think it's important that if if there's people that see, oh, okay, I think maybe the club's not in the right direction, it's important that they at least have a vision of yep. like what they want to do. Yep, yep, absolutely. And and th- and they share that vision with others so that, like I come back to what I said earlier, everyone's got to be on the same page at club level, but also everyone has to have a point of view and have their opinion, at least be able to voice their opinion. Yep. So that then the club can make a decision which way they want to go. But as soon as you leave it to one or two people, then people drop off. And as soon as people drop off, they leave, and then your the size of your committee shrinks, and then all of a sudden there's not enough people to do the work. Yeah. Because there is a lot of work at domestic level. I haven't been there for 10 years. I know exactly registration process, you know, teams, parents, coaches, training venues, all those sort of things that all the domestic clubs who listen to this will, will just laugh and think, yeah, that's exactly what we have to do. So you need me- merchandise, uniforms. You need a good committee of, you know, Five, six, seven, eight, nine. Think some of the bigger clubs are even bigger than that to, to have all those departments covered. And you have, but you have to give those people a voice when you get to your committee meetings, so that everyone can share in the running of the club. If, you're le- if it's left to too few, it won't happen. When you were at Altham and you were sort of trying to get people involved, 
Did you give them an expectation of sort of the time that was required? Yep, yep. you have to. You yeah, have okay. to. Yeah, you have to. You, you, what you don't want to do is scare them and, and tell them that yeah, it's, it's going to be too much, but you have to give them an expectation of, you know, five, ten hours a week, whatever it might be, um, so that they think it'll – and the other thing I've found is you've got to start delegating tasks to them early so that they feel part of it. Yeah, okay. Don't just bring them on and then have them turn up to one meeting every month or every two months and not do anything in between. You've got to make them feel part of the committee – and start to get them involved in the club, and as soon as you do that, they then uh, embrace the position, embrace their, their position on your on your committee. No, so it might be even something small, but it's at least something, a role e- exactly. to make them get exactly. involved. Exactly, something in, yeah, small. Okay. Yeah, to have someone to help with you know, one of the coaches, somebody to manage one of the issues you might have might have come across. Whatever it might be, get yeah. them involved early so they feel part of the part of the association, part of the club. Awesome. Um, so going back to to your board, and we spoke about the great culture, and you mentioned that obviously getting buy-in and getting people to um, delegating roles yep. so they know what they're doing, giving everyone a voice, Yep, that's also there. Is there anything else you think that's contributed to the to the great culture that you have now with your um, team? Probably. Look, all the people on the board at the moment have just got a very good can-do attitude. They're all just good people. Yeah. And, yeah, look, they're, they're all here because they've got children in the program, which is exactly what you want. But um, they're all here for the right reasons and, yeah. and they're doing it for the right things. I'll give the example of someone like um, Mel Painter, who's been on the board for honor. She, as our child safety officer, she does a fantastic job, but she's a teacher as well. So she's got a, such a strong background in in that that we leave those decisions to her. Yeah, you know, to advise that us on that. Yeah, that, correct. Yeah. And she's I know she's worked with you a lot on these sort of things, yeah. but um, she's passionate about it. And when you find someone like that who's passionate about their role, then give it to them, embrace them, and l- and let them do it, and let them come back and advise you because. Oh, that, that's not my area especially, but it is hers and she does a fantastic job. So let her come back and advise us on issues that crop up from time to time. But she's now, she feels empowered. She understands her role on the board and she does a fantastic job at it. Let's take the example now of maybe a club that's going in the right direction, yep. going from strength to strength and people that have, are maybe moving on from committees and, yep. and new people coming on. How do you maintain that momentum coming into a good situation because we often talk about what needs to happen if it's a bad situation. Yep. But how do you sort of maintain if it's a good situation and what things do you think is important for a club to focus on at that level? Well, I think it's important to, to ultimately you've got to let your parents go as, as their children get older, they'll eventually leave the club because they'll go and do other things. So you've got to be constantly looking to backfill people. But what you want to do is backfill them with, parents or people who are involved in the lower age groups and under eight, under 10, whatever okay. it might be, so that they've got some time to build up and then come onto the committee and, and spend some time. Because it's a constant process. You know, as the years go by, boys and girls age out, they get too old, they, they, they might go and play another sport, but you then want to backfill them with parents who have got, who are young, young children who've got ideas, who are keen or excited, who have just who have just embraced the sport of basketball and you want them then to, to get involved. I'm sure they're going to have new ideas, new ways of doing things, you know, social media is so important these days. I noticed at Don Valley, we've got a great we, – we do, we do social media really, really well now. There's always posts going up. And it's important to have someone to manage that inside your club. And, and that's, you know, that's where we're going these days. And, and people want to absorb their content that way. So mm-hmm. having someone on your community who can run that, who's good at that, who's passionate at it, you know, that's, these things are vital. It's the main place that people – it's like the notice board – now, that's, you know, that's where it is. That's people get the information. Facebook, Instagram, yeah. that's where people go these days to get their information, to get their, to get their updates. They don't go to websites as much anymore. They want you know, instant access. They want it to come come on their phone, bang, consume it, away they go. So, Absolutely. So being in the role now, for how long have you been president for now? Four years. Four years. Yeah. What have you enjoyed most about being in that position? Um, look, I, I enjoy I, – I still ref up here every set day and I enjoy that because at that – that keeps me in touch with the grassroots. That keeps me in touch with domestic. I said the clubs, I said the presidents, I said the coaches, I said the referees, the players. So I think it's really important that that I stay connected with that because that's that's where it, that's the heartland. That's where it starts and that's where it ends sometimes. So I, I really enjoy that part of it. I enjoy coming up here and refing and um, you know, occasionally getting getting abused by a parent, but that's okay. That's all part of the fun, right? But it's not okay. No, but yeah. it's not. No, 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 it's not. But I, I've, I can handle it. But I do enjoy supporting the younger referees. So I don't ref that much anymore. I do a few games, but I do a lot of evaluations and help referees. And that's really important. Yep. It's, it's good to be sitting there on the sideline, 
talking to the referees. Yeah, the parents see it as well, and the parents see that you're trying to help the, the 14, 15 year old who's a green shirt who's just come through. So there's a lot of enjoyment and satisfaction I get out of helping them progress through the refing career, make make some money out of it, make a career out of it potentially. Um, so yeah, I, I enjoy that, and of course I love the I love the the programs we've got running up here. Um, that Friday night stuff, I, I occasionally pop up and you know, I've got some buddies who still have boys and girls playing on a Friday. Yep. So I occasionally love watching that. And, of course, I love the NBL one. You know, I'm a fan like everyone else. I love getting in the rooms. I love talking to the players. I love celebrating the wins, you know, commiserating the losses, talking to the coaches, getting to know the players. Um, yeah, that's that, that that's a big thrill for me. So I enjoy coming up here on a Saturday night during our NBL one season, watching our men and women. You know, like I said, I'm a fan like everyone else. I want to get photos. I want to get autographs. You know, all that. I'm, I'm, I'm just a fan too. So, um, well, I think, I think it's a, I think it's a valid point though because I think you get so even at committee level, like it's the, it's the day to day stuff and the, the strategy stuff for you, right? So, yep, it's very rarely where you can sort of measure the wins a little mm-hmm. bit, mm-hmm. and I think like we, we experienced that last season with NBL one with did. the men's team, you know, getting we to did. getting to the final four, and it just allows you that. Yeah, that t- when you have success in that area, it just allows you some time to reflect a little bit and yep. go, oh, this is actually pretty cool. This yep. is kind of fun to be yep. a part of that. Yep. It's great to build relationships with our coaches. We've got some great coaches across those four teams and the players. Like yep. I said, I'm a fan. I love going up to the players and chatting to them and yep. they probably think I'm a pain in the ass at times. I'm like, Here he is. He's his president again. <laughs> just, he's just a hanger. He's just hanging around. <laughs> but, you know, I enjoy it. Like I yep. said, I'm a fan like everyone else and I, and I love watching our, um, our teams play. Um, and a lot of kids that you probably would have seen. Yeah, I've seen the all, all these kids grow up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, don't worry, I'm out there trying to recruit as well, even though I've got, you know, I've got probably very little idea. And I'm sure our coaches think here he's he's trying to recruit for me. Let me do that. But I, I enjoy <laughs> doing all that. Um, I've loved watching our um, Debbie's, Debbie Key and her under 14 girls this year and the yeah. journey they've gone on to. And I, I've loved that. And I love the, they're able to raise a lot of money up here recently at Grand Final Day. And I enjoy doing part of that. And um, it's great to see that. And probably the other highlight for me is um, when you award life membership. Yeah. I've been lucky enough to do that the last two years. And to award life membership to some really, really deserving people is a very special moment. Um, there was one particular, Lynn McClendock, and she gave me my first job at Don Valley back when I was 14. And um, when I was able to award her life membership last year, it was it was very emotional. Yeah. And I get emotional times. It was a very emotional moment because um, she'd given her life to the association as, as had her family, but for her to be rewarded with life membership and to see the look on her face um, and see the tears, and uh, it was a very emotional night presenting that to her. So they're the good parts of the job. You, you, yeah. you love you love rewarding people who have given given heart and soul to uh, Diamond Valley. So they're the parts of the job you really love. Absolutely. We've had a little bit of a gap in that over the years as we well. Have. We have. So we're starting to. So we're very lucky. We've, we've managed to get some of those people back on board, like the Brian Harveys of the world, to come back on and, and um, help us help us with that history and awards committee to make sure that um, we're giving life membership to the right people. And they're, and Brian and his team know because they've been around a long time. Yeah. But for them to be welcomed back to Diamond Valley, to feel part of it now, um, it's fantastic because they can now help us make those decisions about people who deserve deserves to be recognised, and they've done that really well in the last years, and, and will continue to do so. That's important as well, I think, for clubs as well. Like re- recognition of, of volunteers um, and yep. people who have contributed in a big ways can can mean a lot to the people coming on as well. Yeah, because they yep. sort of maybe not strive for it, but yep. they they see that their work is not going absolutely awarded or absolutely recognised. We had Sandra McNeil this year um, awarded it was an Order of Australia, so. Yep. Things like that are very special when someone like that gets recognised for her services to basketball. She's been involved up here for a long, long time at domestic level across multiple clubs. And for her to get recognised, that was a really, really special moment. I was lucky enough to be involved in, in that process. I got to have a chat to her sons recently as well about that, and she was blown away by that. But yeah. to have people recognised for their service to the sport, volunteering, which is so important, is fantastic. So that's what you love about being president, being volunteering, doing doing what you do to see people rewarded for their work. Awesome, awesome, Stu. We'll um we'll we'll finish on the final question that I usually ask everyone, and that is, what is your earliest sporting memory? And can go back oh. to you know the early nineteen hundreds if you like. Yeah, the, you know, yeah. Let's go back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, look, a lot of good memories up here, but. 
probably one that sticks in my mind the most was I I got to a decent stand of refereeing. And I remember one night I went out to, it was back then it was Country League Basketball, or CVIBL it was called. Mm. And I did a game between Bendigo and Shepherd, and I think it was, um, it was at Bendigo. It was a packed house. And I just remember the adrenaline rush. Every time you made a call for the home team, you were the number one. The, the crowd just went up. They erupted. And every time you made a call against the home team, they wanted to kill you. It was such a buzz. I remember, it, well, I think it was one of my first country league games. It was a men's game as well. So there's imports playing. And I thought, wow, mm. this is really cool. It, it was such an adrenaline rush. And um, uh, back then you'd go and have a chat to the players and the coaches after the game. But um, to have the uh, crowd, um, you know, watching and waiting on every one of your calls. And then if it was a good one, you get a massive round of applause. Yeah. It was a bad one. They wanted to tear strips off you. Yeah? Uh, great fun. Great well, buzz. I was talking to someone about that the other day because I think that's a lot with the um, – got a lot to do with the old stadiums as well. It has, absolutely. Yeah. Like it was that, like a cauldron up there. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, the Ice House down in Mount Gambia yep. was one that's like the all their old stadium now. They're in a yep. new stadium. Um, but it, because it's like that tin roof, yep. the seats are really close to the sidelines. Yep. You don't really get that. Not anymore really, with the new stadiums, really. they're amazing. The new stadiums, yeah, yeah. but you just don't get that same sort of atmosphere. A bit like our old Diamond Valley Court, yeah. which is Court, yeah. court One now, Court Five. Um, yeah. yeah, probably the other fond memory was um, we had the CBL on a Monday night, and um, I ref that most Monday nights with some really good referees, and that was a lot of fun. And saw some great players come through there, and you know, to ref someone like a Sam McKinnon who went on to represent Australia and have an unbelievable career was a big highlight to ref you know, guys like that who came through that program on a Monday night, that, that competition that was set up by Brian Harvey. So yep. that, was a, that was a huge highlight as well to be involved to be involved in the games. I wasn't good enough as a player, but I was still able to be involved in the game. So that, I that know, was mate. really I cool. I saw your senior men's well, uh, stats yesterday. I don't want to say too look, much, but you know? <laughs> I shot the lights out last night down at Eltham. So. <laughs> I didn't see that. <laughs> I, still, I still love it. I still get white line fever, but I love it. So it's good fun. Awesome. Well, Stu, uh, thanks again for taking the time. Thanks for everything you do at board level. It's been great. Um, and, yeah, really appreciate you coming in today to have a chat. Beautiful. Thanks, Pat. Lovely to be here.